Our next speaker, Dr. Katie Brewer, is an associate professor of chemical and material engineering at New Mexico State University. She is also co-director of bioprocessing and automated agricultural program at NMSU. She is here today to talk to us about using biochar to help increase soil health. Um, I'm gonna to talk to you about biochar production. And keep in mind, I'm gonna be doing this from the perspective of an engineer. So we will get to soil, I promise. Um, but I'm gonna start the first part with um, how to make char. Waiting for my slides to advance, there we go. So I'm gonna talk about what biochar is, how you make biochar, biochar quality, and what I mean by that, because it has many definitions, and then some of the opportunities and pitfalls of biochar. So first of all, what biochar is, um, it's a solid material. So this is not a liquid, this is not a gas. It's made from thermal decomposition, um, what's key to remember here is it starts from biomass. You're not starting from coal or peat or any other fossil source. This has to be a organic material of recent origin. And the key part with its production is that you have a limited supply of oxygen. So not necessarily a complete lack of oxygen, but a limited supply. And you do it at a relatively low temperature. This is not combustion, which we will talk about in a minute. One of the other key differences, besides that it's made from biomass under limited oxygen, is that its primary use is as a soil amendment as opposed to a fuel or some other application. Now, there are other definitions of biochar. This is the one taken from the International Biochar Initiative, and so this is the one that I'm going to use the most often. Again, waiting for my slides to advance. There we go. All right, so how do you make biochar? Well, I'm gonna assume that everyone on this video call has watched a fireplace at least once. And if you haven't, I encourage you to go do so. And what I tell my students on a regular basis is that one of my favorite things to do is ruin common experiences for them. And so what we do here is we look at what happens to a fire as you place a new piece of wood on it. There are four steps to combustion, and there are some things that are going on chemically in the background, um, but there are also uh, processes um, that you can observe. So we'll start with heating and drying. Every time you put a new piece of wood on the fire, there's some amount of moisture in it, and it's also usually not at temperature. And so the first step, which requires no oxygen, just heat, is heating and drying. You're warming, warming the biomass up and you're driving off the moisture. If you're watching this, what you'll usually see is some amount of steam rising. What's notable about steam compared to smoke is that it's white and it dissipates quickly. The second step is where it gets far more interesting and this happens around 300 to 350 degrees Celsius. So you have to get it pretty hot. And this is pyrolysis. Pyrolysis meaning pyro and lysis, so the use of fire to break things apart. This also does not require oxygen. This is just requires heat. And what's happening in this process is that you're taking the macromolecules that are in a piece of biomass, usually wood, so the cellulose, the hemicellulose, the lignin, you're breaking it into smaller pieces, and then those pieces are decomposing even further. And what you'll see coming off of this, this is where the smoke becomes yellow or brown, and it doesn't dissipate. You can see this, it'll go up in the air and stay there. And this is where tar comes from, if you've um, ever cleaned out a fireplace, and this is made of light hydrocarbons, these volatile gases. And the material that's left behind is you're taking what used to be mostly carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen as sugar molecules, you're breaking them down into mostly carbon molecules as you're driving off these volatile gases. So again, this step only requires heat, and you don't see any flame. All you're going to see is smoke, but you'll definitely smell it. The last two steps of combustion are where we finally need oxygen. This is flaming combustion and char combustion. Flaming combustion is just what it sounds. All of those volatiles that are coming off of your piece of fuel, they interact with the oxygen in the air and produce a flame. 
This is a gas phase reaction. Um, this is where you'll, you'll see a flame, you'll see some smoke left, but this is where you get a lot of your heat and light. Now, if you've watched a fireplace, you know that that flaming combustion only lasts for so long, and then the flames die away. And that means you've driven off all the volatiles out of your biomass, but you still have a solid left over. And that solid still has stuff that'll burn. And that's where we go to the fourth step of combustion. This is char combustion. This also requires oxygen. And these are what most people think of as the glowing coals part of a fire. And so when you look at it, you're not gonna see any flame. And the material you look at will look black to white as it starts to ash. And what's noticeable about this is if you blow on it, if you blow on the coals, they start to blow. The reason this happens is that this is diffusion limited, which means that instead of the volatiles and the oxygen interacting in the gas phase really fast, that oxygen has to get all the way down to the char surface to get to the biomass. When you blow on it, you're making oxygen get there faster and that's why you start to see it glowing. So again, you put on a piece of wood, you've got to heat and dry the wood, and this is why you don't want to use wet wood because pyrolysis isn't going to happen until it's dry. Then you start to see smoke, but no flame yet. Once you need oxygen is when you start to see the flame. After the flames are all gone, you're going to be left with char combustion. So I encourage all of you sometime this weekend to go have a fire and see if you can identify these steps of combustion. And if you're really lucky, bore to death the people watching the fire with you by explaining the different steps of combustion. Now, why in the world does this matter for biochar? Well, this is slow pyrolysis is how charcoal was traditionally made. And what happens in this process is combustion. What we're trying to do is we're trying to go through the first two steps. We need to heat and dry it. We want to drive off the volatiles and condense the solid, but we don't want to burn it all the way to ash. And so we're trying to stop after the second step. However, we still need heat. And so the way charcoal was traditionally made is that you would have a fire and you would just limit the amount of oxygen available so that combustion does occur, but only enough to provide the heat to drive pyrolysis. And so you would pile up wood, you'd put some kind of covering on it, you'd control how much air went in and out to control the temperature and the amount of fire, you'd have some place for all the smoke to escape, and eventually you would be left with your char. So once you've done with all the flame part, you cover it over and you let it cool down. A more modern, Times are, this is done as a continuous process, and you have all of the stages going on throughout. You've got the three, the four stages of combustion. You put your biomass in at the top. It dries using the heat that's coming up from combustion. It starts to pyrolyze. Then you get to the part where they add oxygen, and so this is where you have flaming combustion and char combustion, which burns up just enough material to drive the heat, and then you cool it off, and you have charcoal come out the other end. When you're making this, your biggest issue is that smoke part. This is tar. So this is inside our lab scale reactor, and you can see it makes quite a mess. If you're going to make char correctly, one of the key things you want to ask the person designing the reactor is what are you doing with the smoke? What are you doing with the stuff that'll become tar? In a well-designed system, the volatile gases, all of that smoke will be sent through some kind of secondary combustion so either it's a flame somewhere else that it gets passed through or even be recycled through the char material, you should not have a lot of smoke coming out of a reactor if it's well designed. You want to be burning off all of that tar. All right, so if you're going to control this process, and as engineers, we're always interested in what we can control and how to do it, there are several parameters that affect what you get as a product, whether it's a solid, a liquid, or a gas, because you're going to get all of these phases in your reaction. First of all, it depends on your feedstock. What is the ash content of your biomass? Because that ash is all going to go into the char. And your moisture content, because remember the first stage is heating and drying. So this will determine how much energy you need to dry your material in the first place. Then you've got your temperature of reaction, the heating rate, and the residence time, how long it sits there. So if you put all of those factors together, 
we get what my group does, and that's thermal chemical processing in general. And all of these different processes have different temperatures that they go to, different heating rates, different residence times to produce primary products. So torrefaction, for all of you who drink coffee, uh, this is how your coffee beans are made. This is a roasting process, makes it nice and easy to grind and very tasty. You don't want to do slow pyrolysis on your coffee beans because this produces primarily char. In a good slow pyrolysis reaction, and slow means it's gonna take hours to days, you should get somewhere around 25 to 33% char, depending on your feedstock and your temperatures. Fast pyrolysis is how you make bio oil. Um, we don't do that very often in the biochar world. It does produce some char, but not a lot. The other one you'll see in commercial systems is gasification. This is slightly higher temperature and this, they allow more oxygen in so you get more combustion. The primary product there is the syn gas used for heat and power, but it also does produce some char. And then you've got combustion, which doesn't give us any char. That just makes ash dust just for heat and power. So those are the, the thermochemical processes that we use. So we made some char, now what do we do with it? Now, traditionally, you have these wide variety of uses for char. Um, most of the time, we would use it as a fuel. So this is the charcoal that you put on your barbecue grill. Uh, you can burn it, you can create electricity from it, you can gasify it to produce syngas for chemical reactions, it's a fuel. Sorbent, if any of you have a Brita filter or a fish tank, you've probably seen char yours is used as a sorbent. So water purification, glass purification, also site remediation. We've got a couple of projects now looking at the use of char to absorb heavy metals in legacy mines. Um, and then you've got what we're talking about today, which is char used as a soil amendment and for carbon sequestration. So it's mostly the same material. You tweak what the parameters of production are and what the properties of the char are, depending on how you're going to use it. So here's some traditional uses. But many people ask me, is char, is biochar just charcoal? Well, it could be, but if you're using it on soil, that's when it would be called a biochar. All right, char quality. If you remember nothing else from my talk, I want you to remember what's on this slide. And that is that no two chars are the same. When people say biochar, they're not talking about a single material. They're talking about a range of material with different properties. So how do you determine what's a good biochar versus not? High quality biochar is as follows. And these are all things that you should be able to look at without any particular kind of instrumentation. So first of all, it should be black. It should not be brown, because that means you underbaked it. It should not be gray or white, because that means you overbaked it, you did too much combustion, and now you've left with ash. It should be black. It should be consistent. So you shouldn't have a mixture of brown pieces and black pieces and gray pieces. It should look the same from piece to piece. Go ahead and pick it up. If it's been made well, and if the person designing it, designing the reactor did a good job of venting the gases, it should be powder on your hand. It should leave a black powder on your hand, but it shouldn't be greasy. It shouldn't stick to your hand. That, that powder should wash off easily. It should also not be smelly. You pick up char and smell it, you might get a tiny barbecue smell, but that smell should be very faint. And if you have it greasy or smelly, that means those volatiles, that smoke, that tar that was created, that means they got stuck to the char. And you don't want that. Um, it should be friable. That means it's easily broken apart. So you should be able to pick up a piece of char, break it with your hands, and that means you've driven off or you've condensed a lot of the carbon that was making it bendy and flexible. Uh, you should make it from a clean feedstock. And what I mean by a clean feedstock is that it's free of heavy metals. So for most agricultural and forestry residues, this isn't an issue. If you're getting woody materials or materials from municipal solid waste or perhaps even around your yard, especially if those materials were treated like outdoor treated wood, um, you need to be careful about this and have them checked for heavy metals. So when um, generally, whatever heavy metals go into the feedstock, they end up in the char. So make sure your feedstock is clean before you make char. The other thing is these properties vary, and so you should tailor your char to the application you're using it for. So if you're using it as a sorbent, something like a high surface area could be very important. If you're using it as a fuel, you want a high energy content with low ash. 
content. And so it's tailored to the application and it does vary. But again, if you have a char that's black, consistent, not smelly, not greasy and breaks apart, chances are it's a pretty good char. What does it do on soil? Now the talk right after mine goes into a lot more details about char applications to soil. So I'm gonna summarize them here, but not try to steal too much thunder. In the research, we've seen that char in general increases nutrient use efficiency, increases microbial activity, increases soil organic matter, plant available water, and all of those factors combined together over time tend to increase crop yields. There's an important caveat here though. It is dependent on the char that you're using, it depends on the soil that you have, and it depends on the crop that you're growing. But if you put everything together and average it out, over the long term, you see an increase in crop yields with an increase in the soil quality. Now adding char, because it improves your water and nutrient use efficiency, you might be able to use less. It affects the aeration and the water holding capacity in the soil, which can decrease greenhouse gas emissions from the soil. Um, as an adsorbent, it does tend to absorb nutrients, especially cations. It can prevent nutri nutrient leaching. And because it is light and fluffy, it can decrease soil bulk density. So if you have a very heavy clay soil, sometimes addition of char can help with that. We've also seen char being used in potting mixes for this reason because of its high porosity and lower density. All right. The second takeaway message, if you remember nothing else, so remember that chars are not created equal. Also remember that char is a soil amendment, not a fertilizer. So a fertilizer implies that it provides plants with the nutrients that it needs, the macronutrients, the micronutrients, and that you're going to see an effect of those nutrients in the short term, ideally in that growing season. That is not biochar. Biochar is a soil amendment, which means it is added to change the soil properties. The char still might have some nutrients in it, which can create some short-term effects. So especially if you have a soil that may be low in calcium or magnesium and your char is high in calcium and magnesium, sometimes phosphorus, we've seen that too, you can see a nutrition effect. But most of the impacts of char are going to be in the long-term soil property effects. All right, biochar in the Southwest. So opportunities and pitfalls. Um, as most of you know, we have a lot of biomass here in the desert. And we've got a lot of pecan shells. We have a lot of pecan prunings. Over here in the right upper left, you can see we've got cotton gin trash. Um, we do have yard waste from our cities. And I think all of us are familiar with what's in the bottom right. We seem to have an infinite supply of tumbleweeds. We have a lot of biomass available from which you could make char. Now, many people have come and gone with business ideas for how to make biochar. And many of them get started, but don't last very long. And the reason is that to make a biochar system economical, you usually have to incorporate three factors. Usually, you have to have a waste that you wanna get rid of to begin with. This means that you've got a low cost, abundant feedstock. So that's a plus. There is some additional heat that is given off from pyrolysis. Remember, we're burning the volatiles and the non-condensable gases. You wanna be able to use that heat. And some people will convert this to power. It doesn't produce a lot, be very small. And you want to create some carbon products, whether that's for soil applications, adsorbents, et cetera. Usually, any one of these factors by themselves is not enough to make a biochar system economical on its own. Usually the economical systems are ones that combine all three. And so if you're looking for a biochar opportunity, think about where do I have a waste feedstock? Can I use the extra heat and power? And what range of carbon products can I make? All right, potential pitfalls. These are my last two slides. And as an engineer, I feel a responsibility to give you things to look out for. Uh, number one, look out for undercooked char. This is char that's brown. The problem with undercooked char is you're gonna be adding lots of bioavailable carbon to the soil, but you're not adding a lot of nutrients. Remember, it's not a fertilizer. And so you might have microbes eating up the carbon and scavenging the soil for nutrients, which can inhibit your plant growth in the short term. If 
the reactor is not well designed to deal with the volatiles, you can create smoke and air pollution. Char making used to be one of the most dangerous occupations because of breathing in all the smoke. So whenever you design a pyrolyzer, you need to design it well to burn off the smoke to prevent air pollution. And you don't want those volatiles on the char surface as some of those can inhibit seed germination or growth. You don't want to start with a contaminated feedstock. So again, any heavier toxic metals in are going to be heavy and toxic metals in your biochar. And you need to control your oxygen. If you have poor oxygen control, you could end up burning off most of your carbon and then get a low yield um, or just you lose most of your carbon. Char, one of char's biggest problems for application to a soil is dust. So if you have small particle sizes, it can make a lot of dust. Um, many times people will mix char with a compost or with water or some other kind of liquid to cut down on the dust management, um, but this is a combustible dust. So you need to be careful about that. The other part about combustion is we know that char works very well as a fuel. When that char comes out of the reactor at the beginning, it is very hot and those surfaces have not been exposed to oxygen in a long time. And so as soon as they're exposed to oxygen, they're gonna have these little tiny char combustion reactions. Now, if the char is cool to begin with, those oxidation reactions happen slowly. There's tiny little pockets of heat on the char, no big deal. If you don't cool down the char first before you expose it to oxygen, so say you pack it directly into a truck, you can have a fire. And so make sure you cool it down well. When we make this in the lab, we usually empty our char into a paint can, seal up the paint can until it's cool, open the paint can, and if it ever starts heating up again, close it immediately to prevent combustion. Because remember, charcoal is originally used as fuel. So I can promise you from personal experience, it does burn very well. Um, high ash content. There's been some talks earlier today about soil pH and salinity. Um, this can be a problem in desert soils. So any of that mineral material that's in your biomass goes into your char. And so many, much of that can have a high soil pH. So if you have a high pH soil, you need to watch out for this. If you have a lot of sodium in your biomass, that sodium ends up in your char. Again, it can end up in your soil and high salt content in general if you're worried about salinity. So be careful about this. What can help with some chars is rinsing them before soil application to remove that easily available salt. Um, we have the oxygen, high purchase costs. So as I mentioned before, you want to think of the overlapping synergies to make the economics work. We don't have a lot of field study information on biochars, and it does change with certain soils, certain biochars, and certain crops. And so keep in mind that there's going to be some level of experimentation as you apply this. We know in general that biochars are good for soil, but when you try to identify what kinds of benefits and how much you're likely to see for a given crop, um, we don't have that information yet, or at least not very much. And so that's what I have to present. Um, so you learned how char was made and the four stages of combustion and how we control those stages of combustion to make char that we want. What makes a generally high quality char and some of the opportunities and pitfalls for using chars on soils in the desert Southwest. So I think that's all I have. I'm gonna check the chat and the Q&A for questions. Our next speaker, Dr. Atala Khan, is the senior research scientist at InnoTech Alberta, a group that facilitates the conversion of applied research to economic, social, and environmental benefits for Alberta. He holds four patents in biochar technology and has published many research papers regarding this topic. Yeah, uh, my name is Zataullah, uh, and uh, I work for InnoTech Alberta, which is a provincial research corporation of uh, government of Alberta. Our mandate is to promote economic diversification as well as generate uh, alternative revenues, uh, which are, when I say alternative, it is more non-oil, non-gas, mostly uh, on the ag food municipal sectors. And I have been with the organization for about eight years now. And we have been fortunate enough to be uh, doing, uh, to have 
had an opportunity to work on biochar application development and uh, i will be presenting some of those case studies and this will go uh, very much in line with what catherine has just spoken i might be just uh, browsing on some of the things that she has spoken it was a wonderful primer to uh, be uh, starting my conversation here uh, inotech alberta is a it's almost a 100 year old organization uh, we have changed our name over the course of the history but i won't be going into that but yeah just to say legacy wise we are a legacy corporation of alberta research council we have about four locations in the province we have four 270 uh, research staff out of its 90 of them have uh, uh, specialty uh, have phd degrees in their own fields and we operate in every economic domain that the province uh, is benefiting from and uh, we collaborate with uh, post secondary institutions and uh, and have uh, about a million square foot of research space as well as 600 acres of of outdoor research farm sites where we use that to demonstrate value to our stakeholders as well as to pro help the industry uh, do de-risk its technologies and 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 uh, uh, pilot uh, them at our facilities and um, coming to biochar subject, uh, we started working on in this area in 2006. We worked uh, initially. We had uh, worked with uh, in collaboration with Alberta Agriculture, uh, Dr. Nick Savidoff, who has moved now from Alberta Agriculture to Lethbridge College, has been one of the pioneers in introducing a lot of alternative grow medias into the province so uh, and again when i say grow medias our focus has mostly mostly been on hydroponics and aquaponics so uh, and dr savidov happens to be an, an, a world renowned expert in hydroponics aquaponics and in vertical agriculture indoor vertical indoor agriculture so we we started in collaboration with him and we have conducted several greenhouse studies using biochar and um, and and these are all historical facts where we we started small and then went on to build a consortia the consortia was called alberta biochar initiative it ran for about five years we have generated a humongous amount of data in this subject area which is which i which i found to be unique uh, and uh, i will go through this as we go as in the course of that 14 15 years of our work on biochar we have built our own carbonizers slow intermediate fast pyrolyzers or carbonizers we have built our own systems and which could be batch and continuous as you saw in this previous slide here the one on the top uh, uh, left is a continuous system the one in the bottom is a batch rotary drum carbonizer uh, from there, we went on to acquire mobile carbonizers, so these can go in field and produce biochars of premium quality. And these are available for our clientele and including the consortia in 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 United States to be uh, you know acquire uh, to be leasing them from us and using them in for field biochar production. Coming to biochar, biochar is a very generic term. It's a very, gen as Catherine has already emphasized, it's, uh, uh, it is no different from charcoal except for the fact that when it is used for soil applications or uh, applications where you are trying to benefit the environment, that is where the same charcoal now is termed as biochar. It has to be thermally converted rather than thermally altered. So it has to be properly devolatilized so that all the volatile matter content has to be uh, uh, removed so that it becomes friable, it's free from volatiles, it's free from any toxic organic compounds. Feedstock quality plays a very critical role in the ultimate quality of char. And we had the opportunity and the fortune to be producing chars from every possible feedstock that we could find in Alberta. We have looked at all forestry residues. We have looked at coppice residues from 
coffee plantations we have looked at agricultural residues we have also looked at municipal uh, urban forestry residues like grass cuttings and lawn cuttings etc and and we have we maintain a huge library of those all carbonized materials at our uh, our our facility we do offer some of those samples as research samples for research projects to universities uh, and we have the capabilities to produce chars from a kilogram to a few tons the most recent one for a field trial that we produced was about 2.3 tons uh, for a reclamation site project so that's uh, that's some of the capabilities that we have in house and primarily char is a very generic term as i told you it it's ultimate uh, it it ties back to the feedstock quality it ties back to the process conditions in which it was generate generated and it also ties back to its uh, uh, event uh, sir, uh, physical and chemical characteristics uh, in terms of its particle size in terms of its water holding capacity in terms of its surface area etc and that particular physical chemical traits of char determine its end use so as uh, as we as i told you defining the product quality is critical in this space we have done some work but a lot of that credit goes to international biochar initiative where they have come up with guidelines of quality classified it categorized the char into class 1 class 2 class 3 which which we could generalize it as premium mid grade and and standard grade chars and there are a lot of aspects that go uh, that are associated with a carbonized biomass being called char or biochar one of the first things is its hydrogen to carbon atomic ratio it has to be thermally uh, converted rather than thermally altered so when you do torrefaction as catherine was referring to which is very mild devolatilization of material at very low temperatures you are not thermally converting the biomass from uh, being labile carbon to recalcitrant carbon you are just uh, making it friable uh, and of fuel quality rather than um, uh, soil or agriculture for, for agricultural purposes in that there is a criteria for a material carbonized material to be uh, termed biochar or not and that goes by its carbon to hydrogen ratio so its hydrogen to carbon atomic ratio should be less than 0.7 then only you qualify the material to be called biochar the other aspects of quality associated with biochar are contaminants so it should be free of any organic inorganic and pathogenic contaminants so there are guidelines by ibi that have been uh, taken from other sources but in canada we also have canadian food inspection uh, inspection agency guidelines which also looks at poly, uh, which also is uh, which requires that a material should not contain or should be within the threshold of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons dioxins furans pcbs heavy metals i won't be going into this much uh, in 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 light of time but uh, offline if you de do need any more information on this from a canadian context i'll be happy to send you more information on this uh, but yeah we have we have uh, established a quality certification program within inotech alberta and we have helped uh, several clients in in that space and as i as uh, as i uh, oh, i'm over emphasizing this not all biochars are created equal so biochars have different surface properties different ph uh, values different ecs different water holding capacities uh, based on its feedstock they might retain some nutrient value or they could be inoculated with nutrients and inoculated with beneficial microorganisms so uh, based on the soil application the screening of chars for uh, the desired end result is critical and we have produced chars predominantly chars tend to be more alkaline uh, somewhere between 8.5 to 11 ph they have good liming effect but we have also by screening uh, uh, screening uh, different feedstocks 
have been able to produce acidic biochars in, in the pH of six and sometimes even 5.5, where we engineered the few uh, feedstock as well as engineered the process conditions to be generating acidic chars for more alkaline systems, uh, for alkaline soil systems. So that all that knowledge plays into its end application. And that uh, is something that I will go into uh, in little more detail on certain aspects of application that I'll be speaking to in this, uh, uh, in this talk today. And again, this is, this is the recalcitrant band of biomass to biochar to graphitic carbon. So as you, when you take any biomass material, it, which is predominantly formed of hemicellulose, cellulose, lignin in carbon, hydrogen, oxygen ratios of roughly one, as you start thermally altering it, you start losing your hydrogen and oxygen. And as the devolatilization happen, you also lose carbon uh, along the way in the form of lighter organics to, um, uh, you know, to heavier organics. But in the course of that whole process, uh, we would end up coming to a point where your carbon uh, concentration is far greater than your hydrogen and oxygen, which was originally present in your matter. And as, it, as that point, seven mark is reach your carbon is now recalcitrant and by that by that what it implies is it is it, it is no longer amenable to biological degradation in the system so whether it is a soil system or whether it's a, a, a hydroponic system the meti the substrate biochar substrate would not de uh, decompose on its own and it can be sequestered for a long duration, which is the other uh, uh, added advantage of using biochar in, in soil applications where you do get soil benefits in terms of improving its physical properties, as well as you, um, uh, uh, you could uh, benefit from its adsorption capabilities. So it is able to retain water, it is able to retain nutrients and on a longer run give you beneficial effects. Uh, and that is absolutely true. You will not see beneficial effects of biochar immediately. These effects only start to show eventually over the course of time as this material is acclimatized to the environment around it. So um, uh, quickly going into applications, biochar applications can be classified into two types, wherein one, the, the most commonly heard and most commonly uh, uh, practiced category is the low value where the dollar value associated is is uh, is is low, but the volume used is very high. So uh, with with any field trials, with any reclamation remediation trials, with any deutrification trials, with any potting mix application, where the amount of biochar used is in tonnage per hectare typically in the order of five to 25 tons per hectare, depending on your uh, soil background properties, as well as your end, end, end uh, uh, goal. That's what has been predominantly uh, demonstrated, predominantly studied. And the, the challenge there has been economic. So uh, the, the manufacturers are not able to bring down the price to a point where farmers are able to affordably use it. So that's the low value, high volume end. And we have done some work in that space, but our primary focus has been on higher dollar value, less volume application where you produce premium quality chars from premium feedstocks. And then you also extract premium returns on your investment. And then also uh, are able to uh, get maximized return from the use of the char in those systems. Our, our focus has been in hydroponics primarily. So that's uh, food production in indoor, especially for the climates that we live here in, in, in closer to Arctic. We have also been uh, involved in a multi-million dollar study on char use as cattle field supplement. I will talk about that in the end. Uh, inoculant carriers, odor control agents, activated carbon replacements, and et cetera. 
which are more on the, uh, the activated carbon replacement, mercury capture, uh, and functionalized carbon. This That's more on the absorption and use of biochar, where biochar has affinity towards certain contaminants, biochar has affinity towards certain nutrients. So you could tailor its functionality to the end use. And we have worked in that space and have demo successfully demonstrated use of wood-based carbons in, in those spaces. And we will uh, briefly be talking about that here. Let me uh, go to the main core of today's uh, in a subject, which is biochar use in hydroponic food production systems. So as I told you, we have been opportune to be one of the pioneers in this space. We started working in this in 2006. We have done multiple years, multiple sites and multiple uh, vegetable trials in house and have been have published extensively in this space. So, uh, and this particular program started in 2006 uh, when we were called Alberta Research Council. And this is uh, a, a slab in this picture. You see a slab of biochar where we produce chars using our carbonizers in house and we filled those uh, hydroponic slab bags and then. Uh, then transplanted those uh, vegetable plugs into them and then grew them for the cycle and did sometimes multi-cycling also. And, and, and the comparison was done to coconut coir because coconut coir is the, the main grow media in Alberta, which is predominantly uh, imported from Southeast Asia. So we have grown tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers, lettuce, uh, and these these four predominant greenhouse vegetables in Alberta, in in comparison to in comparison with zeolite, in comparison with raw sawdust, in comparison with coconut coir, which was the biggest competitor uh, in the space for several years. This is lettuce trial, which was uh, done in our greenhouse, and these are the plants grown in biochar on my extreme left the coir on the extreme right and sawdust being in between uh, at the Alberta Agriculture Greenhouse. Yeah. And the yield differences, as you see, this is one of the study which was done on peppers where the Dr. Saividov was able to demonstrate that you could produce, and then this was one of the pioneering works. And then the rest of the work came after this. This was one of the pioneering works where he demonstrated that when you use biochar in comparison to coconut coir in a greenhouse hydroponic system, one is able to produce more output of the vegetable compared to coir and sawdust. And from there, it ushered a whole era of work in Alberta. And we have published this uh, findings in collaboration with Alberta Agriculture in this, tech, in this book. And uh, you're free to uh, download this chapter online and, and go through uh, the consolidation of that seven years of multi-year to 20 plus vegetable, uh, greenhouse vegetable growth trials, which was published here in 2016-17, I think. And, and over the course of next few slides, what I'll demonstrate to you is, these are, these are all the statistics of what has been done over the course of many years in various substrates in various vegetables. There are outliers and there are certain trends. And, and the trend, if I, if I put it in very, uh, without over exaggerating is, biochar is a, uh, is a ideal candidate to replace coconut coir. It is in the, in the best case scenarios, it is able to, produce the same output as coconut coir. And in some cases, it is also able to produce more production, more throughput of vegetables in comparison to other grow stuff, grow medias. In particular, coconut coir being the biggest competitor followed by uh, sawdust and zeolite, et cetera. So the, these are those uh, aspects where here we are showing cucumber trials. And then as you see, the uh, coir seems to be dominating in some of those uh, 
trials, but there is also indication that carbonized wheat straw, carbonized wheat straw, carbonized wheat straw, it's a wheat straw biochar, also produced equal amount of cucumbers in the in 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 a different timing. And and statistically keeping taking all these factors into consideration, we have uh, uh, come to a conclusion that yes, biochar is a ideal candidate to replace coir as long as the economics of the biochar production are brought down. The other advantage of biochar that could be realized is coconut coir slabs are usually used only for once growth cycles, but uh, through our work with Alberta Agriculture, we have demonstrated that, that the biochar slabs could be used for several cycles without being replaced. And being an inert media coming out of a, a, of a thermally treated system where, where at about 550 degrees centigrade, there is no microbial load in this biochar. It has good bio water holding capacity. It has good nutrient holding capacity. It has good uh, uh, buffering capacity, which will allow the root zones to be able to grow irrespective of the changes to the nutrient concentrations, nutrient pH, nutrient EC values. Those, when you take those into consideration, biochar is a far superior growing media compared to coir, because coir needs to be flashed with uh, calcium chloride in the beginning so that it is uh, uh, acclimatized and then you transplant your plant, uh, plugs, uh, plant plugs into coir. Biochar does not need that. All it needs is soaking in, in regular water so that you are now turning that uh, uh, meagerly hydrophobic surface to very hydrophilic uh, surface and now you get your ion exchange as well as uh, new buffering capacity into the substrate. This is another trial done on cucumbers, tomatoes, and peppers. This was done in Kwantlen Polytechnic uh, in Surrey, BC, which also collaborated with us. And here clearly demonstrated that when you used biochar produced from sludge, uh, pulp sludge, and uh, pin chip mixture or a combination of two, you could produce equal throughputs of vegetables in, in greenhouse setting. And the reason why we were using these feedstock was these studies were sponsored by a pulp mill, Alberta Newsprint Corporation uh, funded all this work on these feedstocks. They were looking at diversifying their waste streams and producing value added products off of that because their pulp sludge, which was thermomechanically produced, was a burden to them. They, they were disposing it out at, at certain costs. So they wanted to see if they can produce that, convert that into premium quality chars that could be used in greenhouses in Alberta. Uh, from a scientific technical perspective, we have proven the efficacy of those, but unfortunately, they, 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 ha they are still in the process of building a plant to produce those chars. This, this is, was another study done uh, at uh, another site and on uh, peppers and mini cucumbers, et cetera. So this, the, this, the, the, you, you, could, you will be able to find all the statistics. I don't have to go through this uh, uh, in great detail here, but uh, I will be happy to share this, these publications to, uh, to the participants who are further interested in exploring these. And, and this has assured a lot of work in this space. Uh, one of the few things that are happening now in, Al in the province of Alberta is we people are trying to grow high THC, high CBD cannabis strains in biochar. And we are doing those research trials in our armored greenhouses and armored growth chambers in, 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 our, in our facilities. And we are giving them the the feedback that would uh, be used for them to scale up in their commercial greenhouses. And those things I will not be able to share with you except for uh, saying that yes, biochar is actually a, a very potential uh, candidate for producing cannabis in an organic setting, uh, producing organic cannabis 
in a greenhouse uh, setting in comparison to fish meal and in comparison to other soil mixes it has an, a higher advantage and that is what we have found in our studies here this these slabs were used for seven years by dr savidoff at alberta agriculture greenhouse in north edmonton the the picture depicts what happens to a slab what happens to we we have documented the productivity in that publication that i'm talking about but here i'm trying to depict the comparison of the biochar slab the biochar slab is able to maintain its integrity it does not compact or collapse over the course of time so it which gives you this uh, in, in inference that you know the roots are able to thrive uh, and are able to be healthy and are not susceptible to any root diseases in the grow media so over the long run it actually would have a higher payback for using biochar grow media compared to uh, uh, coconut coir uh, on the algal control side being inert being uh, uh, you know uh, free from any microbial load it, it does not promote any algal growth in in the substrate so that's another added advantage of biochar use in greenhouse uh, food production then another interesting aspect that uh, you know robert also uh, was uh, very interested in of course we have not done a huge amount of work in this space uh, but we are receptive to doing more work based on the uh, based on uh, support from our clients because most of the work that has been pre presented here is all supported by by somebody who would champion this study we we play a very bipartisan th and uh, a role in actually demonstrating scientifically the efficacy of those uh, and uh, these studies are all funded by third party partners right? um, and one of them being the alberta newsprint company but there are other uh, partners that have funded these studies so here in this study we 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 isolated uh, the aspects of uh, we eliminated the aspects of of nutrition and soil etc the aspects of soil impacts and nutritional impacts by growing uh, by inoculating the substrates which is biochar and coconut coir with common uh, fungi which causes plant root diseases fusarium and pethium for tomatoes and cucumbers and looked at the uh, impacts of biochar on disease control and there is clear uh, uh, evidence that biochar definitely does something to reduce if not completely eliminate the plant disease but to reduce the plant disease and we 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 are we we were not able to completely deconvolute what would be the actual actor or factor that was uh, giving us those results but we have two possible hypotheses uh, which in my opinion my personal opinion uh this second uh, the later which is the hormos hormesis is the more predominant factor and what hormesis is biochar is produced from biomass and as part of biochar production you are trying to devolatilize all the organic matter content or the volatile matter content in that by temperature but no matter how much you uh try there will be some residual volatile solids left in your matter which could be 15% of its mass it could be 5% of its mass mass and those volatile solids some of uh, contain a plethora of compounds and some of them are known to have biocidal activity right for example uh, some furfurols some phenolic compounds and some uh, butyric acid uh, not butyric acid but a substitution substitute of butyric acid etc i don't remember those names on top of my head right now but there are we have documented those compounds that have documented biocidal activity as you uh, as you uh, as the plant adapts in a system 
that has some residual organic compounds which are not completely lethal to the plant but it imparts the plant some resistance so because it is sensing an environment where it is not free of any uh, 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 organics it, there are some organics in the system it adapts to that by having higher resistivity and that also leads the plant to be more stronger uh, more diffused and you see the pictures here uh, the root system is far more developed in biochar and there are various factors for that which could be better aeration better water holding capacity better water uh, diffusion all, all these aspects are cumulatively leading to this effect the other hypothesis which is listed former here is biochar has porosity over the course of time one uh, it would become a habitat for beneficial microorganisms and beneficial microorganisms like rhizobacteria etc are known to inhibit uh, the are known to suppress the growth of pathogens in, in some of those studies so these are the two plausible hypotheses that we have put forth and as i would emphasize again we have not done a lot of work but we are receptive to doing more work on, in this space and uh, and are and would be happy to be collaborating with you uh, with any of those folks in uh, southwest united states now let us switch uh, our gear how many minutes do i have robert all right uh quickly going through other application development of biochars in the space of value added products so inoculant carriers as we all know in agriculture peat peat granules are used typically as inoculant carriers typically for solid inoculant carriers peat is is the common candidate we have worked with certain multinational companies to be developing biochar based inoculants these are these have been commercialized in us uh, this uh, last year and they have been commercialized this in canada this year this was done way back in 2014 where we we started with a few kilogram prototyping work and then went up to produce about a ton of material for the client so that they could go and do some field trials and do some product distribution and this is a commercial success and we have capabilities of making multi tons of material and and formulate uh, packages nutrient packages inoculant uh, packages and etc in 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 our facilities at inotic alberta uh, this is another odor control agent application that we recently finished for a client we did for 15 metric ton trial uh, for them where they had a substance which was an organic fertilizer coming from their operations which was very which contained some extremely potent odorous compounds related to thiophene thiophenes and benzothiophenes etc or some other compounds that had very high odor which was causing them which had beneficial nutrition but was causing a lash uh, backlash or you know uh, from their clients and we have successfully incorporated biochar to control that odor in those systems as a result the material is no uh, has no odor and again uh, is able to also retain that beneficial nutrition for longer time so it's able to give some slow release function to it not not completely but this is what we have done again as as aspect of waste valorization and waste residual diversion uh, wood ash there are wood combustors around uh, around north america especially associated with forestry mills they they use their residues to produce their own electricity and heat and they uh, end up have producing some ash which is rich in carbon content we have we are working with uh fp innovation which is forest products innovation canada on a multi in sector multi industry project at looking how could you use that waste residue and then use it for producing 
liming agents we use it for producing uh, materials then which could be used in greenhouses and potting mixes etc so that's something that we have uh, done for the last couple of years and the results are very promising it, the material is able to meet the threshold toxic and concentrations or uh, regulated by cfia so there is uh, there is more greenhouse trials to be conducted in this space finally i will uh, i will start wrapping up my talk here as i told you we have we are we are part of the consortia uh, with uh, with the lethbridge research center with the university of lethbridge uh, with school cool planet um, which i don't know if it's still active in us or not but the, it's a multi million dollar study funded by agriculture agri food canada uh, of involving feeding cattle feeding the uh, 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 cat, uh, for meat production so feeding cattle certain amount of biochar rations to be produce, to be improving to be improving it, their feed to body mass ratios to be reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions this study is led by uh, canada's leading veterinary researcher professor mcallister uh, in collaboration with professor erasmus okin from lethbridge college so we were actually brought in to be doing the toxicity profiling on those jars which were supplied by cool planet in 2015 16 17 so we did a huge screening study in our labs and demo and and based on our study they chose the best and the safest candidate for feeding cattle the study is coming to an end they have published a lot of literature on this space in this space and the results are very promising in terms of uh, improving the uh, feed efficiency in terms of marbling effect uh, and again this has been published and also on the ghg side there have been uh, some uh, improvement found and as well as on the nutrient retention so from a deutrification de standpoint also there is promising results uh, for those who are interested in this space i will be happy to share and guide you to those published references and with that i would wrap up my talk this is another sorbent application uh, which might uh, which would be certainly of interest uh, in united states where we took chars produced from wood we functionalized them and we proved that you could use the same chars uh, to capture mercury in coal coal fired power plants in collab this was done in collaboration with capital power corporation at their genesee power plant where in we took commercial activated carbons from darko and compared our char biochar which was produced probably at 1/5 of the cost of that darko sorbent and proved that yes it is equally potent in capturing mercury from coal fire power plants with that i would wrap up my talk we do have we have benched pilot to Uh, pre-commercial capabilities in at Inotec Alberta we do have a study stream of us clientele and will be happy to engage with more uh, through the uh, uh, Arizona University consortia on the south uh, on this uh, southwest uh, soil health forum with that thank you very much and um, uh, i'm i I'll, i'll be happy to take some questions